Okay, so I gave you all about 10, 11 minutes for that one. By the way, I don't ever recommend necessarily timing individual games to the 8 minute, 45 second time constraint, but I do want to, of course, have enough time to cover this game and now some other stuff too, so we have to have some limits here. It's a pretty hard one. I mean, logic games are not in a perfect order of difficulty, but there is a general order of difficulty. So the fourth game probably won't be the easiest. The first one probably won't be the hardest. Is it ordering a grouping? Let's, let's just start there. Grouping, perfect. The centers are not really in order. There's no before after component to it. So we're grouping them, yeah, exactly. We're taking the five materials, putting them into the centers. So you could do it this way. Whether you do it horizontal or vertical, I don't think it really matters, honestly. It's really up to you. We have a minimum of two, and we have the five materials. So I list the five materials. I make a diagram where we replace the materials into the diagram. We have at least two, but no more than three. So we can make a hard line here where maybe we will have one more above. We have the rules indented. Any center with wood also has newsprint. So we could say, if wood, then wood and newsprint are together. We have anything at two is also at one. So I'll just draw a little arrow. Anything from the second center will go on to the first as well. We have only one center with plastic, and plastic and glass can never go together. So those are all just the fundamental rules laid out. No real inferences yet. Did anyone make any inferences for this game? Any connections between the rules? Well, we've got only one plastic, right? And we know that anything at two is also going to be at one. So anything at two repeats onto one. So thoughts? Perfect, yeah. You all got it. So there's no plastics at two. Plastic could be on one, could be on three. We don't know, but it's definitely not going to be on two. And of course, glass and, pla glass, glass and plastic cannot go together, so those interact as well. But that's pretty much all I would do up front for this game. Not a ton in the way of inferences, which means we will probably be drawing more over the course of the game. First question number 18 is a typical orientation question where you just want to take one rule at a time and apply it to all five choices checking for violations. It's much more efficient to do it this way than to take one choice at a time and apply all the rules to that choice. Because then you're cycling through all the rules again and again and again. So let's just take one rule at a time and go through all five. So let's take, for example, just the first rule. If you have W, then you have WN in the same in the same category, in the same center. What can we eliminate based on that? So let's look for cases where we have wood, but no newsprint. Perfect. A has center three with wood, no newsprint. So A is out. Any others? No, no others. Typically, you'll be able to eliminate one choice with each rule. They won't give you that many eliminations based on one rule alone. They want to force you to cycle through all the rules, which I think is okay because it's a good warm up that way. Next, anything at two is also at one. What can we eliminate based on that? Perfect. C has GNT on two, but GNW on one. So C is out. Anything else? No, once again, nothing else. How about the next rule, only one plastic? E, perfect. E has two plastics, so that's out. And we have one rule remaining, one wrong answer remaining. P and G can't be together. What can we eliminate? D, perfect. So by elimination, B is our answer. And that's how you want to work through an orientation question, just one rule at a time by elimination. So that's 18. Number 19, somebody already said this actually. We can't have plastic on two, right? 
so plastic is left to be on one or three. And it really is as simple as that. You could just pick D and move on. If you wanted to and you weren't totally confident, you could skip number 19 and come back to it later because by then you would have drawn more valid scenarios that could give you cases where you've proven that plastic could be on one or three. And by the way, we also have our correct answer from number 18 to help us out here. 18B has plastic on three and we know that works. So any choice for number 19 that does not list center three is automatically out. So you would be able to eliminate off the bat A and C, even if you didn't know anything else at all. But then of course, we know just by intuition that plastic on two works, plastic on one, three works, and we can always come back to it at the end if we want to confirm that. Number 20, if center two has three kinds of material, what must center three have? So we're saying that for this one specifically, we're gonna have all three on center two. What's gonna happen as a result? Yeah, perfect, awesome. Yeah, you got it, exactly right. So plastic will have to go on three. The reason is that if three ha center two has three types, center one will also have three types. And as a result, they're gonna be the identical. Centers two and one will have to be the same because you have three on both. So you're gonna end up having G on two, G on one, plastic on three. And that's all we need to know. That gives us number 20. You don't have to draw out the entire scenario fully. There's way too much ambiguity to bother doing that anyway. We only have to go as far as we need to to solve the question. And they tell us plastic on three works. So excellent job. So um, that was C is our answer for number 20. Number 21 now, if each center has three kinds of material. So now they're saying that not only do one and two have all three, but now all three of them have all three. So all three centers have three materials each. So what can we infer from this? Just like previously, we're going to once again have glass on two and one, and plastic on three. There's no other way to do it, because if you put plastic on one or two, it'll be on both one and two, because if you have three materials on two, those same three will be on one, so one and two will be identical. What that means is you have GGP on one, two, and three right off the bat. Now remaining, we have T, W, and N left to play around with, but we know that W requires W and N to be together. So you're never gonna have T and W in any of these two remaining slots. You're always going to have N and then one of T and W left to place. T and W can't be the only two because again, W requires W and N together. So you'll have N, then T or W on one, T or W on two, T or W on three. But that's really enough. We don't have to flesh out specifically what happens on that top level there. We can simply run through the choices once again. So looking at this one, anyone have thoughts? Or oh, we're, we're figuring that out right now. So we have G on one, G on two, P on three, and on all three of them, work by elimination. Could center two have glass? As the only one? No, correct, perfect. Center two is not the only one with glass because glass is on both one and two. Only center three with newsprint. No, newsprint is on all three once again. Only center one with plastic. That's not even happening at all, period. Only center three with tin. Could that happen? Yeah. That would be fine. So. D is our answer for this one. And then just to be thorough, we could look at E. Only one with wood? Why not? Because whatever's on two is also on one. So if you have, you could have TTW or WWT, but you're not gonna have WT or TW. Because two and one are always gonna be the same if they both have three. So it's D for number 21. Then on to 22. Would 
No, it's, it's, it's an inference that I made because we know that. I'll, I'll set, take a step back for a second. So all three centers have all have three different materials each is the constraint of this question. So we know that it's going to be GGP because you only have one plastic and two and one repeat. We also know that anything on two is going to be on one. So if all three of them have three, that means that two and one are going to be identical. Now we have T, W, and N left to place, but W requires W and N. So you could never have W and T. That just would not work. So as a result, how do you avoid that? You either have W and N or T and N. But either way, you're going to have N there no matter what. So I just said, let's say we're going to have N on all three of these. And then we'll put essentially T slash W in the remaining. All right, so that was 21. Now we are on to 22, which is going to be a little bit different. If center three has glass, so if center three has glass, what can we infer? Where's plastic going? Perfect. Now, as for this, what are we going to have here on two? We're not going to have plastic. We're not going to have glass, because glass on two would mean glass is also on one, and P and G conflict. So once again, we're left to these three, T, W, and N. But we know we're not going to have, w, we're not going to have T and W together as the only two, which means we're going to have N automatically. And then we will have T, W, or both. But N is a given. We could say we'll have W or T there, and maybe the, another one as well. We don't know, but again, they repeat. So what that means is that you would actually have N here, N there, T, W there, T, W there. So actually, this is the limit. But we don't really need to go any further. We have our answer. We don't need to draw more than is necessary. We know, we learned, N will be on 2 no matter what. That is a must giving us B. Any questions on that one? Yeah? Yeah, sure. Plastic is never on 2, period. That's a general inference for the entire game because anything that's on 2 must also be on 1. And our initial rule says there's only one plastic. So if you put plastic on 2, you'd have to have it on 1. And that's having two plastics already, violating that rule. So that's 22. Then finally, 23, the last one. If center one is the only center with wood, so wood is on one, it's not going to be on two, it's not going to be on three. What happens as a result? Well, W requires WN, right? So we're going to have N there. We can't have plastic on 2 as a given. And we also know that 2 repeats onto 1. So we automatically face this limit where anything here going to be there. We can't have three things on 2, of course, because then we'd have four things on 1 since W is only going to be on 1 specifically. So we could say as a result here that who's our most easygoing variable that we've seen popping up again and again and again? It's n, right? n's going to have to go on 2 as a given because we're going to have the things here repeating over there, and w's out of the running, and p's out of the running. We have left n, t, and g left to place. But g has to go somewhere, and it's going to have to go on 2 and on one as well. The reason it's going to have to go on those places is that if it didn't, we'd have nowhere else left to put it. We're not going to have P there. 
We're not going to have P on 1. We're going to have P on 3. So this repeats over there. Since W is only here, we're not going to have it on 2 as well, which means that these two guys have to go there as well. Any questions on this one? You all good? All right, so this is everything that we infer as a result of this. The only variable that we have not yet placed is T. The T has to go somewhere. Where is it going to go? 3, perfect. And that's it. So they ask us, what could be a complete and accurate list of what's happening within one center? Well, it's pretty limited, right? It's one of these, these, or this. And so we get a hit right away with choice A, P and T on 3. So that's the game. It's not the easiest game for sure, but it is doable. You just take this limited, these limited rules plus the arrow and just apply them again and again and again. And the game becomes a lot easier if you could take those rules and kind of absorb them into your short-term working memory. And the way you do that is by practicing. So you could lay out the rules for yourself, then cover them up or fold that over the paper and see, can you replicate all the rules of the game? Like without looking, could you rewrite every single rule of the game? Only one P, P and G together, P and G never together, two repeats onto one, and so on. Just repeat, and you'll see that a lot of the games, a lot of the harder ones even, they have few rules, but the rules they do have are complex and a bit more theoretical and abstract, harder to diagram, but you've just got to force yourself to absorb it and just apply again and again and again. If you have to keep looking back at what's written on the paper from LSAC, it'll take you way too long. And you also want to get good at drawing lots of hypotheticals and drawing them quickly also. Like we drew probably four or five diagrams just for this game. Some games will have less, some will have more but you want to be able to do it when you need to. Sometimes the only way you can learn inferences is by drawing new diagrams, taking it out of your head, taking it beyond just the question stem, and turning it from being abstract into being concrete to see the inferences that logically follow from the constraint of the question. Any questions on this game overall? So this game you might see, it's from Juno, it's from Juno 7, one of the free LSATs. And this was back when they had only a one-page layout for logic games. Starting in test 66, they switched to have a two-page layout for logic games, giving you slightly more space, more scratch paper, which was really nice to have. But now, with the digital for format, you're going to have essentially unlimited scrap paper, that booklet where they'll give you more, 14 pages, 16 pages, more than enough. So I used to tell people, only write on the page, get used to the constraint. That's now out the window for those of you who will be taking digital. Instead, you pretty much have all the scrap that you need. So take advantage of it. Feel comfortable drawing new diagrams. Don't try to do everything in your head. I see students try to do it. The LSAT games are meant to push, your, to push you beyond those limits and force you to write things down. So don't try to be a hero and do it all in your head. Put it on the page. Draw things out. Be OK with making mistakes and learning. That's part of the process of getting to absorb what's going on with the game is taking the rules, making them intuitive, and then seeing all the inferences that can result from them. But drawing it out is really the best way to learn it. I draw everything out. I don't do it in my head. It would just be way too hard. And there's no bonus points for doing it in your head. No one's going to know whether you did or not. They just want to see the correct answer on the Scantron or on the tablet. Any questions on anything I've covered so far? Yeah? So if one practices this technique, would they finish the logic game? That's a great question. So not all games are of equal difficulty. Like, like I said, 845 is only an average. Some games should get down to six, seven minutes. I know it sounds crazy, but it is possible. There are some game types that have just repeated again and again over the years. And if you can refine your understanding of those concepts, it can become very smooth then you have a time bank built up to apply to the tougher games that might appear elsewhere in the section. Like, anyone seen Legally Blonde here? Yes, yeah, so you know that they have, a, they have a scene where they have her working through a logic game with CDs that are new and used. That game is Test 31 Game 2, and it's one of the most difficult games ever. But there are actually many other games like it that have been administered over the years. They chose that one for the movie because it sounds so ridiculous and complex, but you can make it manageable by doing lots of games of those types, developing your understanding of the concepts. Because they do repeat themselves. There's been like at least six or seven games like that. And I can actually list them for you if you like. 
So the CDs game is test 31, game two. But there are many others just like it. Test 33, game two, which is the birds in the forest game. There's test 36, game one, the fruit stand game. There's test 45, game three. And there's test 58, game two with the volunteers. Now, I also wrote my own logic game of that type on my website as well. But basically, you see they're just repeating the same concepts over and over throughout these games. If you do all of these, then this one won't be so bad in the end, even if it is a little bit harder, of course. They repeat themselves over time. There are pattern, patterns to this test. If you've only done five or 10 exams, you may not see the patterns, especially because you're just studying this for a month or four months or whatever it is. But someone like me, I've been doing this for 15 years now. For me, I've done these games enough. I've done them all like at least 20 times or more so I can see the patterns and show them to you. That's really what my goal is, 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 is to make them relatable. But you see, they span for over a 27 exam period and there are even newer ones that are similar as well, but I don't want to spoil anything for you. But they repeat over time. There are patterns. On my website, the LSAT blog, I kind of break down things by category, by game type. I even have an article where I, I talk about seven logic games that repeated over time. And this is just one category. There are six other categories where there are two games or more that are incredibly similar to each other. So if you do the older one, the newer one becomes easier and more manageable. I suppose I should talk a little bit about what else my website and free resources contain. So I'll do a little bit of a walkthrough for that now. So like I said, I have the different sections, games, reasoning, reading comp, plus test day prep covered. The most popular resource are my schedules. These are self-study schedules. I have free week-by-week -week ones. I also have premium day-by-day -day ones breaking down for you exactly what to do every single day over the entire course of your prep. I also have guides, cheat sheets, checklists, explanations, and full video courses for every section. They're not $1,000. They're basically month-to-month pay-as-you-go. They also let you attend my live online classes as well as part of the package. So it's not just watching a video with no interaction with the instructor. I actually hold at least two to four online classes per month where you can actually ask your questions. I hold them at night. I hold them in the afternoon so that they're accessible for anyone depending on your schedule. I have two free classes coming up. This is my free class in person at my office in downtown Brooklyn. I hold it once a month. The next one is later in June, I think the 26th. It's a Wednesday night. You can attend free in person. I cover logical reasoning. I, I cover games. I answer any questions you have. That's a free in person class. Then the one today at 5 p.m. is a different link. That's digital LSAT. 531. And so it is case sensitive, capital D, lowercase, digital, capital LSAT 531. And that's today at 5 p.m. If you want even more LSAT and more of me, I understand if you don't want to bother, it is a Friday afternoon. But the in-person is going to be on a Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in downtown Brooklyn, near Atlantic Terminal Barclays in Fort Greene, near City Point. If you're familiar with that, there's a Target and Trader Joe's nearby if you want to grab a snack beforehand or afterwards, but I do give pizza. So those are two free classes I have. There's the courses, there's the schedules, a lot more. There's also the YouTube channel and the podcast. I highly recommend because reading stuff is boring and you're already doing enough of that with the LSAT in college. So watch the videos, listen to the podcast. The podcast is on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and pretty much everywhere else. Just search LSAT Unplugged. My website, just Google my name, Steve Schwartz, and LSAT blog, you'll find it pretty easily. And that's pretty much all I have for you today. Uh, any questions or anything, I've covered it all. All right, well, if nothing else, I want to thank you all for coming. I'll let you go a little bit early for today, but it's been a pleasure having you all in the class, and so thank you again for coming.